Hello guys, this is Ola Yeni, Dear Colola Daniels, popularly known as Dear Co Spectre, and welcome to another episode of Dear Co Talks Law. On today's episode of Dear Co Talks Law, we will be talking about the Maxim 2 on the Maxims of Equity. And the Maxim 2 states that equity follows the law. But before I go directly into our class for today, if this is your first time of coming to my channel, please make sure that you click the subscribe button and make sure as well that you click the notification bell so that anytime I release a video of this nature, which is going to be of interest to you, you'll be one of the first set of people to watch that particular video. And also make sure that you follow me on LinkedIn at Dear Colola Daniels. Now, going straight into our topic for today, which is the fact that equity follows the law, it is pertinent that if you have not watched the, the first lecture on the maxims of equity, which is the fact that equity will not suffer a wrong without a remedy, kindly make sure that you exit this video and watch that video first because it is pertinent for you to follow the maxims in their order in order to have a comprehensive understanding so basically today we are talking about equity follows the law and i'm very sure that you must have watched the first video before you continued with this one and let us go straight to our note before i then expatiate while explaining so equity follows the law equity never challenged the common law as the basis of all laws of the land indeed equity could not have existed without the common law since the chancellor originally merely interfered here and there in order to do justice between the parties where the common law failed to provide a remedy it was only later that equity developed into a distinct body of rules and principles most of those rules will be meaningless if divorced from the rules of common law onto which they are engrafted and supplement the rules of equity were developed to supplement the rules of common law and sometimes to mitigate the common law rules as stated in the case of Ade Central Nigeria Limited versus OAU a 2005 case the court of chancery in developing the rules of equity never claimed to override the court of common law equity respect a man's legal right unless it would be unconscionable in his part to take advantage of them as stated in the case of Archibong versus Duke and also in the case of Chidok versus Coca. Indeed, equity presupposes the existence of common law. The conception of trust does not mean that there is no owner at common law and another in equity. Accordingly, equity accepts the common law ownership of trust but compels him to exercise that legal ownership for the benefit of the seste qui trust by engrafting the equitable obligation upon him. Equity intervenes if common law disregard certain rights. Now, before we continue with the note, I think at this juncture, it is pertinent for me to make a little bit of explanation. Now, for you to understand what it means when we say equity follows the law, you need to understand that the reason equity came up in itself is because the law was inadequate or unconscionable which means it wasn't fair or just at certain points that means that for equity to be evoked first of all we must recognize that there is a law do you understand that what does that mean now let me take you back to contracts a little bit of contract if you can remember statute of fraud 1677 now before the promulgation of statute of fraud people used to buy and sell land anyhow in england now because 
people were buying and selling land and most people were illiterate they just say ah you see that your plot of land at Oju Elegba or that your plot of land at uh, Ajegule I know that is England and I'm using uh, Nigeria but just flow with the example so that's your plot of land in Ajegule or your plot of land at uh, Oju Elegba I want to buy it you know illiterate they do not know what it is like to buy or to sell land deed of conveyance or this one another one they do not know so they just oh yeah take hundred thousand take land but that same person that said take hundred thousand take land i sold that same land that same land he has sold it to 10 other people even not 50. do you understand that now because there were so many cases in courts in relation to land mr a sold that same land to mr b to mr c to mr d to mr to mr z all of them he collected hundred thousand for each of them for that land they you know what mr a will do mr a will not jackpot he will not abscond with their money so land let us say he sold the land for one million to each of them that's 26 million ran away to from england he ran away to bulgaria or to belgium he has done yahoo yahoo now he has jackpot from every other person do you understand what i'm saying and those 26 people or as many as he sold the land to would then go to court now burdening the judges with how do we decide the case of who is the owner of the land so because of that the legislator they now sat and said mm, mm, how do we solve this then they promulgated a statute known as what the statute of frauds 1677 which amongst other things stated that where there is a land transaction where the interest on a land is to be transferred from a party to another that transaction must be evidenced in writing and by evidence in writing they meant that it must be a transaction that is signed under deed you know there is a very big difference between a transaction signed under deed and the one that is in writing writing is a casual contract signed under deed is a written contract do you understand that when a transaction is signed under deed that is what is known as a written contract in law now where am i going to with this where the landowners knew that they have promulgated the statute of fraud 1677 that was when they now said eh, eh. so all land transactions are supposed to be what they are supposed to be right in writing if they are not in writing it means that the transaction is what void beautiful fantabulous they now started their operations again they will go and meet those illiterates. Imagine you go and meet all those uh, Yoruba women, uh, you know, selling pepper or, you know, the illiterate Igbos that are selling cotton or this, you know, and they just say, one name, that land, they cost uh, 15 million, just 15 million, and it's all yours. Does that Igbo man know what they call Statute of Fraud 1677 that says that all land transactions should be in writing? All he understands is, I transfer 15 million to you, the land is mine. Do you understand? So then they said, yes, fantabulous. This is another lucrative area. So they started doing that all over again. And then when they went to the common law courts, those Igbo men, those uh, uh, Yoruba women that sell pepper, the Igbo men that sell cotton who are illiterate and they do not know what it is that they have just done, they went to the court and said, ah, my lord, I transferred 15 million and the deal is 15 million to you, land to me. I transferred the 15 million to him. The land is not coming to me. My lord, in the common law court, we say, well according to the statute of frauds it says that it must be in writing where it is not in writing it is void void means that it is unenforceable so mr Igbo man that sells cotton kindly leave my court and then the Igbo man will now begin to cry hey jesus what has happened to me my 15 million is gone this is where equity comes in equity comes in to make sure that where the law is becoming too rigid is becoming unfair it is going to clothe the person who has been unfairly treated in common law with something known as equitable interest 
are you listening to me so in this case where the man the Igbo man goes to court the Igbo man cannot have a legal right to the property because he has not fulfilled the conditions according to the common law court to clothe him with such legal rights however equity will clothe him with a right known as equitable right which gives him equitable interest on that land therefore this goes to show that equity cannot act unless common law has failed can you hear that equity cannot act unless what common law has failed and if we go to the case of Ade Central versus OAU it tells us that the rules of equity were developed to supplement the rules of common law and sometimes to mitigate the common law rules are you listening so equity cannot act in itself except the common law has been inadequate so in this case of statute of fraud the statute was developed in itself to stop fraud but people started using the statute as an engine of fraud and equity even when it is to follow the law even when it is to respect the law will not make those other people use that same law as an engine of fraud do you understand that also when we go to the case of Archipon versus Duke equity respect a man's legal interest unless it will be unconscionable in his part to take advantage of them as stated in that case of Archibong versus Duke and the case of Chidok versus Coca. Don't forget that when I was teaching the history of equity, I told you that there was a particular case before the Lord Chancellors where somebody built house on another person's land. Now, this person who owns the land knew very well that that house that he was building, he was building it on his land. When he did the foundation, he did not see anything. When he did roofing, he did not see anything. Painted the house, he did not see anything. Now it is now time to enter the house. Then he now went to common law. That is the owner of the land. He went to the common law court and said, My lord, quick, quick, plantator, solo, solo, said it. Which means whoever owns a land owns everything beneath the land and above the land. Therefore, this man built his house on my land and therefore I am the owner of that house. The common law court said, yes, that is it. That is the legal principle. But when they went to equity, Lord Elimshire said, even by the law of God, Whoever builds a house must what? Must live in it. Which means that where the common law courts are proven to be unconscionable, are proven not to be fair, the equity that the Lord Chancellor or the Court of Equity will look at that same circumstance and say, no, this is not fair, this is not just, and this is not conscionable. Therefore, this will not stand. And because it will not stand, we will make sure that this person who has labored who has toiled to build the house on this land where the other party the owner of the land knew that he was building yet kept quiet he who comes to equity must what must do equity we will talk about that maxim later in our 12 maxims you know in relation to equity but for the man who was the owner of the land he who comes to equity must do equity therefore equity will not avail him in that circumstance but we avail the other party who built on the land this just goes further to show that equity cannot act except it follows the law and lastly before i continue with the notes equity accepts the common law ownership of trust but compels him to exercise that legal ownership for the benefit of the sesterquit trust by engrafting the equitable obligations upon him equity intervenes if common law disregards certain rights so in relation to trust as well the sesterquit trust is the beneficiary for those who do not know the beneficiary i explained in my last lecture where i was talking about equity will not suffer a wrong without a remedy in that class i explained to you that you know you have a you have a the uncle and then you have the son now the son there is the sesterquit trust because the son there is the beneficiary 
Do you understand that? So now, do note that in that circumstance where equity came to clothe that son with equitable interest, do note that they never said that the legal interest is extinguished or they never at any point said they do not recognize the legal interest of the trustee. No, they recognize the legal interest, but because it will be unconscionable for that person with the legal interest to deal with the property in such a way that will be detrimental to the beneficiary, they then clothed that beneficiary with an interest and they said, if you at any point see that this land is to be used anyhow, come to court. If he's using the land anyhow, come to court and obtain an injunction to stop him from using the land anyhow. So that by the time you are 18 and old enough to carry that land, you are going to still have what your father gave to you. Do you understand that? So let us go further with our note, which says that equity was, however, not free to accept or reject provisions of statute because equity must follow the law, which I have already told you. Thus, a court of equity is just as much bound by statute as much as the common law court. There are instances, however, equity refused to follow the law, i.e., that is, where it would not follow a statute to be used as an engine of fraud. As rightly put, I love this statement by Kayo Deesho, JSC, Justice of the Supreme Court. I love what he said in the case of Transbridge Company Limited versus Survey International in 1986 case. What did he say? He said, surely equity should not be treated as a tyrannous phenomenon threatening the law. It should not exist in vacuum. Or supposedly to roam about pouring water on the fire of law. Equity is not a warlord determined to do battle with the law. It is part of a legal system which has been mixed with the law and purpose of achieving justice. This is beautiful. Equity is not a tyrannous phenomenon. Equity does not threaten the law. Equity does not exist in vacuum. Equity does not seek to pour water on the fire of the law. Do you understand that? You don't plead equity every single inconvenience you have. Oh my lord, equity. Oh no, equity. No, that is not it. That is not how equity works. And that is the reason you must understand each maxim of equity. Because through the maxim, they give you an understanding. They give you a way on how to use equity. So when we say he who comes to equity must come with clean hands, it means that when you want to plead equity, you yourself must have done equity. If you did not do equity, you cannot plead equity. Do you understand? So, for example, the man who watched, he sat down, he watched as someone else was building on his land. Then, when the person had finished building, he now came to court and said, My Lord is my land, though. and quick, quick plant, that also Solo Solo said it. And then, when the other party pleaded equity, that okay, he was building another, he now pleaded equity. My Lord is going to be unconscionable, my Lord, for you to carry my land and, you know, give it to another person because he built on it. Then, the court will say, You, when he was building, what did you do? Did you did you do equity yourself by coming to the court to say, my Lord, come and stop him? Did you do equity yourself by going to tell him that that is not your land? No. You calm down. You were enjoying. You thought that, yes, somebody is going to come and build mansion on your land. Fantabulous. Wonderful. So now that it has... It is seeming to turn the opposite direction. Now you want equity when you yourself have not done equity. Do you understand that? So, when you are talking about equity, you must understand that you don't plead it in every circumstance. You must understand that it is not a tyrannous phenomenon. You must understand that equity should not be used to threaten the law. You must understand that equity does not exist in vacuum. You must understand that equity doesn't roam about to pour water on on the fire of law do you understand that so with that i think that we've gotten a very good perspective in relation to our class on the fact that equity should always follow the law 
thank you so much for watching to the end of my lecture please make sure that you subscribe like and share this lecture video with your friends and also make sure that you follow me on linkedin very very important my next lecture is going to be on the maxim three which says that where there is equal equities the law shall prevail where there is equal equities the law shall prevail it's been a wonderful lecture i'm going to see you in my next class